Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. You could also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have Matthew Alexander. He's a Rothbardian, anarcho-capitalist, uh, voluntarist, and libertarian. He's author of the book Wither We, uh, which is a science fiction action adventure uh, and includes a lot of Austrian economics, Rothbardian libertarianism. You know, the fun stuff. <laughs> and uh, his website is uh, MatthewBruceAlexander.com. Um, and uh, he's got a Wither We Facebook page as well. Just need to throw him a like because we all need more likes, right? <laughs> um, and you could also, he'll, he's also written um, articles, uh, or, well, movie and book reviews, libertarian style, um, on Prometheus-Unbound.org. So you can check out his stuff there. Uh, so, uh, Matthew, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I uh, I saw you on Facebook posting your stuff around. Like, who is this guy? And uh, <laughs> anything anything that's featuring you know Austrian economics and uh, anarcho capitalism, like I'm all for that. I'd love to support you know rappers or um, you know any kind of authors, article writers. So you know we all use our you know preferred avenue or medium for promoting the message of liberty. And uh, you know it's all good. You know we're getting different audiences. So so yeah. so I'm very happy to have you. Um, so. Can you, before we get into uh, the book, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, your uh, path, you know, your journey to volunteerism, to anarcho capitalism, what got you started, and and what uh, books, you know, podcasts or authors um, uh, influence you the most? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I uh, started life in a Republican family. Uh, growing up, I was a very firm Republican uh, when I was a kid. Uh, I was maybe a little more on the liberal side. Uh, the first time I ever heard about libertarianism, someone mentioned it in high school, libertarians, and I, I asked him, well, what's that? And he said, well, they're the ones who are socially liberal but economically conservative, which is not a bad two-second starter definition, although it, it's not completely accurate. But at the time I heard that and I said, oh, that's what I am. Uh, although I was I was mildly libertarian, I would say very mildly. I was very much in favor of the drug war as a kid. Uh, then, towards the end of high school, just being introduced to uh, new ideas, new things, and some classes I was in, you start broadening the view. You start questioning uh, what you actually are. Although I I never stopped at that point and I don't think I ever stopped being something vaguely conservative. And then one day, uh, PJ O'Rourke, who is from my hometown of Toledo, uh, was back in town. Very, very funny author. Uh, he was back in town giving a lecture that my mom went to and she bought a couple of his books and gave one to my sister and one to me. Uh, she gave to me all the trouble in the world which I read and loved, although looking back at it now, I, <laughs> it's very insufficiently libertarian <laughs> from my perspective. But at the time, it seemed, I, I thought P.J. O'Rourke was a radical, but he started making really good points. And uh, I started to be pulled in more of a libertarian direction. And I then read Parliament of Horrors, of course, which is his best book, uh, hysterical book. And you know, moderately libertarian, and I started getting interested in questions of policy. And I don't remember the exact route I took, but I, I started reading more and more people. I read a little Milton Friedman. At that point, I had not been introduced to Rothbard, and I got involved, eventually started calling myself a libertarian. This would have been around 1999 or so. And I started calling myself a libertarian. I started doing some activism for the Libertarian Party in Ohio. At this time, I was at Ohio State, so I was down in Columbus, Ohio. And I campaigned for a candidate who won, actually. Uh, and, and then just slowly, you know, inevitably, if you're going to take an honest look at the arguments, it, it's hard not to become an anarchist. I mean, you almost have to try not to. And actually, I, I did for a time... Be, I remember I spent uh, all of, just basically all the year 2004 where I basically said, you're an anarchist. But for some reason, the idea was scary to me. Hmm. And maybe just coming from my uh, 
bourgeois Republican background. It was too radical or something. But I, I just I couldn't think there was someone I had connected with online who was an anarchist, and uh, we would roam uh, this particular forum just blasting away at the socialists. And uh, it, it came out at one point that he was an anarchist, and I thought, holy cow, dude, you're really radical. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I talked with him a bit. He didn't really try to recruit me that hard, but I talked with him, and he was the first one who really uh, mentioned Rothbard to me. And like I said, for basically the whole year of 2004, I was basically an anarchist. I was just in the closet. <laughs> and I remember it was in January of 2005, I, I finally just came out and uh, told my wife at the time, who I had turned into a libertarian, and I finally said, I'm, I'm an anarchist. There's, there's no reason to have any government whatsoever, uh, at least nothing that we call a government nowadays. When I talk to people about my views, they say, well, you're proposing a government. It's just a different style. <laughs> and I say, okay, fine, it's a government, but nothing we call a government on this world resembles what I'm talking about. So I think it deserves a different term, mm -hmm. but whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, I'm an anarchist. And that was also the time when I decided to write Wither We. I, said, I, had, I was always a reader growing up. I kind of sidetracked into cinema for a few years and wanted to do something with that. And maybe someday I still will, but I don't have the right temperament to put together a, an independent film project. 90% of that is asking people for money and I hate asking people for money. Uh, so that wasn't going to happen, but I've got a great temperament to sit down and just write a script or write a book or whatever. And I'd always wanted to be an author. In fact, I had written a, a few books as a kid. Uh, nothing that I would ever want anyone to read. <laughs> it, it was good practice at any rate. Right. So I decided, well, I'm going to write, uh, write a science fiction libertarian novel. And that was in January. And by about May... Of that year, I had done enough pre-planning, and I finally sat down, and five years later, got it published. Wow, very nice. Um, you know, I find it amazing um, when you when we look back on on our evolution, you know, of you know our intellectual, you know, uh, development. You know, we get influenced by these by these things that just happen to happen to us. You know, books or people say something, or like you said, you met somebody online, and and it's really amazing how that happens. Like like you know, me doing this show. You know, it's funny people come up to me and like, you know, this is so awesome. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you just said something that just clicked, and it's like really, it's a, it's an amazing thing to to have that happen to somebody and oh, yeah. and think that Absolutely. you that you that you were a part of it. You know, uh -huh. uh, it's an amazing. I thing. was uh, I was looking up whether we on Google just to see who was talking about it one day, and this guy I don't know who he was. He left a comment somewhere saying uh, he was a libertarian. He said, although actually. I would call myself more of an anarchist now after reading Wither We. Uh -huh. And nice. I thought, oh, <laughs> isn't that cool? I, my life has not been for naught. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that's, that was the best feeling in the world. Yeah, yeah, it's really amazing how we just, we just, you know, content creators like, you know, authors or article writers or, you know, make a podcast or, you know, like me doing these interviews, you just put content out there and you don't know what would happen with it, how, where, where people would take it, you know, how big you're going to get or people are going to ignore you completely, hopefully they won't, yeah. <laughs> but you really have no idea and it's a, it's a great, um, it's a magnificent process. Uh, so uh, that's great, that's an awesome story, I, um, yes, yeah, um, like, like for me, I, uh, I came from, um, you know, more of a democratic household, but, you know, I didn't really care about politics, but, you know, I, I slowly got introduced to um, uh, Anatomy of the State. You know, actually, first it was a Creature from Jekyll Island, um, oh, Ed, okay. Edward G. Griffin, and then, uh, yeah, so I did a lot of research in the, you know, precious metals and monetary system and also in economics, and then, then I got into more volunteerism, medical capitalism through Stefan Molyneux because of the peaceful parenting. I got introduced to him through mm -hmm. peaceful parenting and, you know, spanking, anti-spanking and stuff. And then uh, that's that was my backdoor entrance into uh, anarcho-capitalism and volunteerism. So, yeah, okay. I, I owe him a big debt of gratitude for that. But um, uh, so so yeah, so about your book. Um, I mean, I don't know how much detail you want to go into it, <laughs> but how <laughs> would you how would you describe your book uh, and you know what it's about? It's it's written in three parts. Uh, part one is a rebellion against a tyrannical government, and I go into 
uh, or the, the story gets into uh, why government sucks, essentially. <laughs> uh, part two is an attempt to demonstrate how there can be a better way, uh, a voluntarist way. And then part three is a shorter part, and it wraps up uh, ideas and it was my attempt to universalize uh, these Rothbardian ideas that had I'd been playing with in the first two parts. Yeah. Mm. Cool. I mean... Um, uh, it happens about 800 years in the future on a, a different planet, a okay. couple of different planets it, it happens on. Yeah. Earth is talked about but never visited in the book. So a far future story. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, it's, it's such you know I I admire authors, especially ones who are you know writing fiction. Like like it's like you have to have such a creative mind, and then you know to create these characters and then interweave their stories and then have it come together at the end. And <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's, really... I got my strengths and my weak points. Uh, you know, it's interesting reading other authors talk about their stuff and what they find easy and what they find hard because a lot of times it's very different from. From me, I mean, there's some things like plot for me has always been easy. I've never had a problem fashioning a plot, making a plot work. Hmm. But I, I have I have difficulties in other areas. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's always always interesting to to read other authors and how how they approach things too. So are there other um, like libertarian or anarch anarcho capitalist uh, fiction writers that you have read? Yes, I I have read uh, a few. Uh, I haven't read Larkin Rose yet. I guess he's got a fiction piece out. A lot of people speak very highly of him, so oh, yeah. I want to yeah. start reading his stuff at some point. Uh, there is a book I read, and I reviewed it for Prometheus Unbound, called The Shield That Fell From Heaven, mm -hmm. which was a very pleasant surprise because I thought the book was going to be crap. Uh, <laughs> it was some small publisher, some first-time author, uh -huh. uh, and he solicited a review from us so we, of course we were happy to do it and uh i read the book and i was quite pleased with it and it starts out as a historical novel and becomes more science fiction as they go in fact becomes very science fiction as they go although in a in a plausible way that i accepted mm -hmm. it didn't jump the shark or anything like that <laughs> and uh and then examines it, it takes a, a certain technology and it uses it to examine the very nature of government in a way that i found quite brilliant uh very well written uh, a deliberate attempt to kind of capture a 19th century style which is when the story takes place mm -hmm. so i thought that was a very good book and i've kept in contact with the author he, he was working on another one last i heard i expect it'll be out pretty soon uh, so there was that. I, I've read uh, I, I've read a few other things. Uh, that, that's the one that stands out to the most. The most that I can think. Of course, there's uh, Heinlein's "The Moon Is a Harsh Mistress," which comes within a hair's breadth of being a narco capitalist. I think, mm -hmm. uh, which was good. Although I don't think that that's Heinlein's best book. Hmm. Uh, I think he had some other stuff that was better, but it's good. I enjoyed that. And, of course, there's Atlas Shrugged, which isn't an anarcho-capitalist, but mm. it's a kissing cousin. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. Larkin Rose, he's a, yeah, a really amazing writer. I think, you know, very um, clear and precise. Um, Passionate, I've heard. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I read The um, the Most Dangerous Superstition, although that's not uh, fiction. But I think I think it's The Iron Web. That's the fi his fiction book? Is that's it? Yeah, that might be it. I think yeah, so. I can't remember the name of it. but Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, um, yeah, he's really amazing with the way he can articulate these ideas, you know, in a simple and direct way so that people can understand it. Because, you know, um, <laughs> you know I, I think it's... It demonstrates your your ability or how much you know a, a subject. Um, it, it demonstrates how well you know it by how easily people can understand it, right? How well you can you can you can transmit the message and articulate it to people. Because if people don't understand what you're saying, what's the point? <laughs> if you're yeah. trying to you know use words to impress people, be, you know impress people and show your knowledge, but nobody understands what you're saying, it's self defeating, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you can't explain it such that a third grader would understand it, then maybe you don't understand it yourself. So exactly, yeah. It's, I think it's uh, Albert Einstein quote: it's "Like if you, if you, um, if you can't explain simply, then you don't know it well enough." 
Yeah. Right. And and I always I always fall back on that because I think it's so true. And that's one of the criticisms I think some people have of uh, of volunteerism is like you know that's that's utopian, that's idealistic. You know, it'll never happen. <laughs> No. You know, it's too sim- no, oh yeah, no. This is just like that- ending slavery, right? Right, right. This, this is the one I get. It's you're oversimplifying things. <laughs> you're over. I'm like, that's the idea. You want to simplify. You yeah. want to, you want to complicate things. Is that just what like a scientist? You and your simple, elegant theories. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, I don't even. I'm, I'm not even sure. I mean that that phrase almost has no meaning the way it's used. It's it's when they've run into something that they they can't rebut. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very new to them. They're still struggling with it, but they don't. They don't want to say, "Well, oh, that, that's an interesting point. Let me think about that." They, they still just want to argue and not accept it. So you get the that's utopian, or that's just ideology, or that's you're oversimplifying things. And you're right. And, and I, there's always my favorite. I I say, well, you know, we're not going to argue about whether it could work because there are societies that have used it. And I talk about the old West and the U S or Ireland for a couple thousand years and right. point out how, you know, anarcho capitalism of a somewhat Rothbardian flavor was used. And they say, well, okay, but it's a modern industrial <laughs> economy now. And, right, right. and then I ask, okay, so what is it about the modern industrial economy that would make this system not work when it worked before uh-huh. and of course i've never gotten an answer then 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 they usually change the topic <laughs> and then when i insist on asking the question seven or eight more times they finally get pissed off and go away but <laughs> yeah yeah you know you're oversimplifying you're overgeneralizing your utopian basically i think what that old, the old boy boiled down to is you know what you said like i can't i don't know but I don't want to say I don't. I don't want to admit I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I hit a brick wall, but I don't. I'm gonna just lash out and throw an ad hominem. Yeah, know, it's insult, oversimplified. You know, and which of course is a charge that could be leveled at democracy too. Oh yeah, we'll all just get together together and vote and pick our leaders and they'll lead us. I think you're oversimplifying. <laughs> I mean, that, that charge could be leveled at anything. I mean, right, it's, right, right, right. Without it, it's basically saying, well, you got me, but I ain't gonna admit it. <laughs> yeah, and the way I look at it is that you know when you when you expect the government to take care of your problems, that's that's essentially being a lazy, you know, that's that's lazy morality basically because you're not taking the responsibility on yourself. You know, mm-hmm. what would I do in this situation? How would I deal with the poor? How would I deal with sick people around me? You know, what, you know, it, it's it, you know, it's always the answer is always the government will take care of it. You know, just, yeah. if we just get the perfect person in power. <laughs> To enact the perfect amount of laws to create the perfect amount of violence in society, utopia would be reached, <laughs> right? The right amount and the right kind of violence will get it taken care of. Yeah, yeah. So, so it I, I encountered that a lot, and uh, I mean, I mean, at that point you got to back down because at that point they're like the you know the wall went up, and they're just not going to accept anything you say, yeah. you know, regardless of how logical or rational. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not, they they need to at least mull over it a little bit. So right. So so let me ask you about about Rothbard. Uh, so what what works of Rothbard do you appreciate, or, or have you read? Uh, what works of Rothbard have I read? Let me take you to my bookshelf. <laughs> oh shoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it'll just be easier that way. Let's oh, see yeah, here. Nice. We've got. Uh, you can see it well. We've got Conceived in Liberty. Wow, look at that. Panic of 1819, Four New Liberty, Ethics of Liberty, America's Ooh. Great Depression, and Power and Market. Wow. And, of course, at one time or another, I've probably read about half of uh, Man, Economy, and State, just piecemeal on the yeah. uh, Mises.org or right. else. But I, I I don't know how much of it I've read. I've read a lot of it, and then of course he had a lot of articles too that I've read. But that's that's my Rothbard section of the library there. Nice, yeah. Rothbard was a big influence for me, especially um, Anatomy of the State, um, uh, the Case for the Hundred Percent Gold Dollar, and um, and then what was the other one? Um, I forget. But uh, but yeah, those those small, especially Anatomy of the State, that was very powerful. <laughs> Very powerful one, and I think I was recommended by Lou Rockwell when I first heard him. Like, well, I gotta take a look at this one. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's like a like a brain explosion, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it there's there's a connection that he he just said, and sometimes you read things and you just say, yes, that exactly, right? Yeah, couldn't have said better. That's exactly it, and it, 
Yeah. It was, it, yeah, I felt a lot of that. Uh, I don't consider myself an objectivist, but I felt a lot of that reading Atlas Shrugged, yeah. which I read. I read that before I was an anarchist. But I, I remember just thinking, holy cow, she actually wrote that in a novel <laughs> that people read. I, mean, <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. I heard it was, that Atlas Shrugged is like the, is like the second best-selling book aside from the Bible. <laughs> yeah, I, I've read that. Now I just read that quotations from Chairman Mao was. So I, I don't know what to believe. <laughs> but I, I, which I, I definitely like one more than the other. Right. But, uh, I, 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 have, I have heard... I have heard that. I don't know whether or not it's true. I it does seem to be generally accepted that the Bible is number one, <laughs> but yep. uh, I mean Atlas Shrugged still sells millions each year wow. over half a century after it came out. So right. it it hit well. It was what fifty seven, so almost half. A, yeah, fifty eight years. So wow. Uh, yeah, I mean it it's it struck a chord somewhere. I I just with, with a book being that popular. I would I would like the ideals to be a little more popular than they were, as well as Ron Paul did. He he didn't do nearly as well, obviously, as some of us would have liked. Mm. Uh, I mean, there's 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 an audience out there for those ideas, and it made people very passionate. But we we don't live in a libertarian society. That much is very clear. Yeah. So I mean, we've got to raise our children to be libertarians. We've got to convince our spouses to be libertarians. I, I say if just pick one person a decade and just go to work on them. And if every libertarian can convert one person per decade and then their kids, I mean, it's yeah. the, the only way to get our utopian society is enough people have to be convinced that it'll work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think we need libertarian schools. Mm -hmm. That that would be the best way. I think we need to teach kids libertarianism like Catholics are taught Catholicism in Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. I think we need libertarian schools there's a certain type of intellectual person that you're going to be able to connect with. I think a lot of people, though, if they don't get it in their childhood, they're just never going to accept it. And I think we need a critical mass of people, which, I, mean, I don't know, 10%, 20%, whatever it has to be, who are really dedicated to libertarianism and considering that 70% of the rest of the population is just interested in the ball game. Mm -hmm. And what the Kardashians are doing, I, I, I mean, th those are the people that they they just need to be civilized. They're they're not interested in policy and politics, and never will be. But we need we need a bigger group of people dedicated to liberty. And people always ask me, well, how do you do it? How do you enact a revolution? And I say I don't know that any more than I know how to run the market. It'll happen on its own. Mm -hmm. People are dedicated to the cause. I don't have to worry about how. It'll happen. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about that anymore, and I have to worry about how I get a cow in Nebraska to be a hamburger in New York. It'll <laughs> happen if people are free to do it and right. want to do it. Right, right, right. You just need people who want liberty, and we, we don't have enough. The trends are good in the last 10 years, I'd say. I mean, I think definitely we're trending up. We're a bigger presence than we were, but mm -hmm. we've gone from microscopic to kind of sort of noticeable we have a long way to go yeah one thing i like about um about volunteerism is it's it's more a, a philosophy of the means right you know how do you achieve something you know what do you do not the end like like you know laws are like you know this will be this law will be enacted so we have 15 dollars minimum wage that's the end right but what's what happens in the intervening time who gets affected and who gets harmed they, they don't really care about that yeah <laughs> you know? so that's uh, what volunteers uh, it's about the mean like you just said you know who cares how it will be how, how it will happen how the hamburger gets eaten or how the revolution happens i mean I, I I think of it more. It's like an, a, a you know you affect people's ideas and you know thoughts and those are really powerful. Like that's what really creates real change. So that's what really we're trying to do. Where the the way uh, what's his name uh, Bill Bupert put it, we're we're uh, philosophically terraforming the planet one obedient surf at a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's one of my favorite uh, lines of his. Is that you know. Um, yeah, so so if you can, like you said, you know, just be patient and just, um, you know, the other thing is try to make this philosophy so attractive. It's like, you know, it, I don't think we'll get far if we're just disparaging and belittling every single other philosophy, whereas we just have to say, you know, this 
the, the way you know living like this and believing these things makes me happy you know yeah and and it's just it's a philosophy of of peace of love and compassion true mm-hmm. compassion not like welfare state i'll steal your money and give it to this person compassion yeah. that's not compassion but uh yeah it's true compassion so it's really a philosophy of love the way i look at it and i think it, once we can communicate that to people then it's irresistible that they're going to want to uh embody that as well yeah absolutely and that raises another important point that i've started uh hitting a little more often is there there seems to be a divide among libertarians between the libertarians who want to watch the world burn and the libertarians who want the social order to at least be stable uh-huh. uh, and work as well as possible until, and I am definitely in the latter, latter category. Um, I, especially with all we know about how the brain works and how when your emotion gets going, totally cuts off your neocortex and you don't think logically when you're emotional. I think we need peace and stability is the best way to sell the libertarian message. I, I don't want to see, I, I mean, I, you know, I want to see the American empire collapse, but I don't want to see some violent tumultuous mm-hmm. period of collapse mm-hmm. because Adolf Hitler has come out of that sort of thing. Yeah. Definitely. And you can't, you can't appeal to people when they're scared. Mm-hmm. You can't appeal to people when they're angry. You've got to get them. You know, I, I, I want the system to be stable enough so that people can at least consider alternatives because whenever, whenever anything goes wrong, the market gets blamed and if society collapses because of the government, people will say, look at how much we need government. This is proof that we need government. As soon as the government fails, it becomes proof that we need government. <laughs> and yeah. that, I, that's what I don't want to see. So I, I don't fall into that, let's gum up the works and destroy the system in a big ball of fire. Right, right. And if I, if I get uh, picked for a jury, I'm not going to... Uh, I'm I'm not going to vote guilty unless it's some type of violent crime. Even a thief, mm-hmm. I don't think, should spend time in jail. I think he needs to pay restitution. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I, I, even violent crimes, I, I think jail is usually, almost always, the wrong way to go about things. There are some people who need to be removed from civil society. But, uh, I mean, so in that sense, I'm not going to help if the cops come to me and ask, did you see that guy running by with a marijuana? You know, <laughs> where'd he go? I'm not helping. Right, right. Yeah, I'm not going to do that sort of thing. But right. at the same time, you know, if there is a murderer, I want the police to catch him. Uh, if, you know, I, I want the court system to work as well as it possibly could. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I think the best message, you know, the best conditions to sell our message is when people are not scared when things are working. Because otherwise, the market's going to get blamed, and people are going to be scared, angry, and they're not going to listen. Mm-hmm. So, what what side of that do you find yourself on? Uh, well, yeah, I think I'm, I'm I'm in agreement with you as well. Like like um, you know, there's um, a couple ways I look at this. One of them is this cartoon where you see these um, the, the, these these mob of people pulling down a, a statue of a dictator, and then underneath the ground another statue is coming up, <laughs> right? It's the revolving dictator, right? So yeah, you're right. Violent revolutions elicit violent uh, dictatorships <laughs> to rule them, right? And the, and the problem is because you're not appealing to people's you know, ideas, their their philosophy. They're not understanding it philosophically what freedom is, right? So it, it, the idea is like government is not the buildings. It's not the people in the uniforms. It's not, you know, uh, really the tanks or the weapons or anything like that or the IRS. That's not really what government is. Those are, those are real things and they exist really. But what gives those power and legitimacy is the people believing that they yeah. have the power and the legitimacy, exactly. <laughs> right? So, so the real source of the power is in the minds of the people. They give those legitimacy. And so if we don't affect the minds of the people, then you can burn all that, destroy all that, and they're going to create it again. <laughs> that's, that's an excellent point. In fact, I, I get into that in Wither We a little bit uh, with my main character when he is, he's been detained and he's waiting what he thinks is going to be an execution. Mm. And he, he decides, well, I'm going out in a blaze of glory. He, he reflects on how many criminals, once they're detained and handcuffed, they go meekly into their cell 
or into the execution chamber uh, because, you know, authority has been demonstrated over them. Mm. But he says, authority is mine to give. Mm-hmm. You, have no, you may have power over me, but you don't have authority unless I choose to give it to you. Mm-hmm. And I don't recognize the legitimacy of your authority. <laughs> and, and that's where it is. I, I love the cartoon about the people don't know their own strength. Right. It's a bunch of people standing on one end of a plank while yeah. a politician <laughs> stands on the other end overhanging a cliff. Right, right. Like walk that. off the plank. Yeah. Oh, Just yeah. walk off the plank. You give him the authority. And right. That I mean, that's yeah. That's a, you're exactly right. And whether we deals with that a little bit, and we've just got to con- people convince people that the state is not legitimate. Yeah, yeah. And and, and the other way, is Stefan Molyneux put it pretty greatly when he said, um, you know, if if we live in you know, let's say um, uh, a church religion dominated society, um, and you murder all the priests, you will you will kind of de facto create an, an atheist environment, but not really <laughs> because <laughs> because as long as the people believe in God, they're gonna they're gonna appoint new priests, right? They're they're gonna, new ones, they're right? gonna yeah, replace them. So so you're not affecting the mind of the people. That's really the source. That's the root, right? And, and yeah. you know Henry David Thoreau, right? There's a thousand, a thousand uh, hacking at you know hacking at the branches, and only one hacking at the root. <laughs> the root, yeah, <laughs> right? which is a great a great line, yeah. Right. So so yeah, you're right. You know that's that's um, that's the difficult job. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know the easy thing. The easy thing to do is just just you know we'll just you know find some people and they're gonna make all the decisions they're going to do all this i don't have to i don't want to worry about the economy i don't want to worry about the monetary system <laughs> i don't want to worry about foreign <laughs> policy we'll just there we're going to have a secretary of state we're going to have the press he'll make all this i'm sure he'll do a good job <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it's just amazing how you know when, when people you know hand over their liberties like that um it just you know, it's such as I mean, I don't know how why they get surprised that it gets trampled and destroyed in times of warfare and and you know government. You know, you, you know, you you hear about all this, uh, you know, boondoggles and and government projects that you know go absolutely nowhere and are completely inefficient and wasteful and actually harm people. And mm-hmm. people are like surprised, like wait a minute, government's not supposed to be doing. This. <laughs> yeah. Like, like did you? <laughs> how can you be surprised? <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know. I mean, it's. People have faith in the system. I, I try to think back to myself because I was one of them at one point. I don't. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's. But then again, I guess when I started reflecting more and more on it is when I started drifting more into libertarianism. So I. I don't know. I, I've. They. I have read and I completely believe it that when libertarians are tested on the way they think. Uh, we score very, very high in the logical realm. We, we tend to be logical thinkers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think the message can reach the logical people. We've, we've got to find a way to get it uh, out to a broader audience and, and you know, songs, movies, books, that sort of thing is the way to do it. Uh, there's a certain type of person that, you hand them the ethics of liberty by Rothbard and it's going to have no effect on them. Right. right. But if you give them a character they can relate to who goes through a sort of libertarian story or Mm -hmm. uh, that there's a certain type of person who can be convinced by that. So I, I myself have never found that very convincing. I just like writing stories, which is why I do it. I I always found a good rigorous argument by Hans Hermann Hoppe to be, what I find convincing, but th- I guess it's a, it's a minority of people who think that way. <laughs> yeah, that's and that's exactly why I love to interview and promote the work of you know authors like yourself or people who make um, you know cartoon animations featuring you know uh, voluntarist ideas or rappers you know or um, you know just different people who have or, or just people who have a YouTube channel and they just put out you know various stuff. It's just you know the more the the more vary the avenues of uh, of expression that we can use, the more people we will affect, right? Because you're right, <laughs> some people will only react to a rap song. <laughs> other people yeah. only react to a cartoon animation. Other people need a fiction novel. Other people need, you know, pure philosophical or let's say pure Austrian economic text. Some people want that. <laughs> yeah, we gotta we gotta you know broaden our horizons. You know, expand our uh, influence. <laughs> Reach as many people as you can. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, wherever I go, like for example, I um, 
I, um, I do the homeschooling with my kids, so I'm out and about meeting other homeschooling families and, and parents. And so, um, you know, a lot of homeschoolers are generally, um, they're already critical of the, of the uh, you know, public education system. So I kind of just, you know, kind of push them along <laughs> like, wait a minute, if government can't do education right, <laughs> let's, let's examine some other things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you do you um like when you um do you talk about these things in your everyday life like when you go out or uh, like how do you do you try to start ta- conversations or only if people approach you? Uh I I used to start them a lot more. Uh I, I in the last few years I've gone a little bit more HL Mencken where I'm I'm just enjoying the circus. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um no, I I I do. I I try to i'm i'm less aggressive about it now i i try to do more of when i was young and brash i i go in and i just say you know are, are we allowed to cuss on your channel i don't know yeah, it's fine, no problem. <laughs> oh, no problem. But I, I just say all right motherfucker i'm gonna beat you in this debate <laughs> with the with the brick of libertarian logic and, <laughs> right right now, I mean, it's more of just, you know, plant a seed here and there on one particular topic, right, make right. people see things in a way they haven't seen. I mean, I, I've gotten some reactions, uh, you know, about legalizing marijuana. And uh, if you strip it down to what it, the drug war actually is, people don't really confront it that way often. And if you present it to them that way, so, I'll, you know, those, someone is on the fence about, well... I mean, marijuana is bad, but I don't know, the medical marijuana, and, and I'll just say, I, I don't think someone should be put in a cage like an animal for having a plant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and a lot of times people, no, I mean, it doesn't convince them yeah. in that instant, but a lot of people haven't had it put to them in that way before. And, and they think it, their first reaction, well, oh, that's kind of funny. And then, but then a lot of times it'll stick with people because, well, you know, what he said was not inaccurate. It wasn't <laughs> exaggerated. That's what we're doing. So, I mean, things like that can have an effect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, I mean, the, the best way to convince someone is to establish a relationship with them, a, mm-hmm. a good relationship, yeah. uh, so that they'll listen to you. Uh, so, you know, people will work if... They, uh, if they get to know you and they trust you and they respect you about certain things and then they find out you have, you know, this perspective on something, they're willing to listen to it more. Yeah, yeah. My approach, uh, because I have a background in stand-up comedy, so I use comedy a lot to, oh, uh, to, cool. to help relax people, you know, break the ice, put down their guards. You know, I know some people, they, uh, they use alcohol they, they say they say you know before you talk to somebody you know lay on some harsh you know um anarchist philosophy just say you know let's go out for a drink have a couple of beers yeah. and that calms people down and relaxes their guard and mm-hmm. they makes them more inviting to what you have to say um and another the thing doug is and hope fan say again doug san hope fan oh really a big time <laughs> i yeah. love that guy that guy's, oh, yeah that guy's great um the uh, the Larkin Rose uh, this one Larkin Rose idea really resonates with me, which is like um, people have their beliefs maybe ten percent because of logic and ninety percent because of emotion. Yeah, <laughs> right. And, that, and that's about the balance too. I I think yeah. So so yeah so so basically what he says is um, you don't always even have to make like the complete case for voluntarism and. And, you know, convince them taxation is theft and it's, you know, a violation of consent and all this kind of stuff or government's, li- li- you know, so all you have to say is sometimes they never even hear of, of, a, of an idea until you mention it, right? So if you were to go up to somebody, just a stranger, and just, I, I guess you're talking to them casually and then you say government is illegitimate and then walk away. <laughs> 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 it's like, maybe that's the first time they've heard that. And then they're going to be like, wait a minute, that's interesting. Okay, so if it's the first time, they might not get, they might not um, accept it. But then it, it, what if it's the second or the third time? Because some people are the, 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 um, of the mentality that if they hear something enough, they're going to be like, you know what? You're not the first person to say that. And then they're yeah. going to be more likely to believe it and they might <laughs> assume it just for that reason. Yeah. Oh, and sometimes it's not even a conscious process. Sometimes it's just once they're accustomed and it's no longer strange, right. yeah. they can grapple with it. Right. They, they, uh, they don't like uh, new ideas or things they haven't heard before, but they just it's not even at a conscious level. If they 
just get used to hearing it. It's like uh, Einstein's relativity. Mm-hmm. Uh, no one actually understands what the hell the dude's talking about. <laughs> but once, you, if you hear space time enough times, you become used to hearing it and right. you're comfortable with the term. Yeah. But I mean, you can't honestly claim you know what space time actually. You can't picture space time. <laughs> right, in right. Sense thing, but <laughs> yeah. So I mean, so the same. It can work in a in a good direction too. If you put up a million signs across the country, government is illegitimate. <laughs> At the very least, people have gotten used to it, and now it's a it's a topic that can be discussed. So that's one step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, and and one of my friends, um, uh, he he made the analogy that the mind is like a, a man on an elephant, right? And that the man is the logical part of your mind, the elephant is the emotional part of your mind, <laughs> the re- reptilian primitive limbic system type. <laughs> and you can appeal all you want to the man, and the man can believe you. But the emotion, so so you could tell the man go left, and and he'll understand and everything. But then the elephant's going to go right <laughs> because it doesn't <laughs> care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is true. Right. So we yep. have to learn to we have to learn to understand the elephant. Basically, <laughs> how do we appeal that, to the elephant? That uh, that raises the topic of why I think science fiction can be so successful for libertarians because it takes you away from your biases and your prejudices. Uh, and let you approach something that you're not yet emotional about. Uh, so, you know, whether we have put 800 years in the future on a different planet, because there was no one there who had any opinion about the political parties on the planet they're on. There's no one there who had preconceptions about this group of people or whatever. They're just, whereas if you come here and you start talking about Republicans and Democrats and you put things in familiar settings, then you have to deal with the familiar prejudices. Mm -hmm. So science fiction can get around that. And that, that can be very useful for libertarians. Yeah. That, that kind of reminds me actually now I, um, I I also have a interest like, um, you know, when I was in high school and early part of college, I was reading a lot of um, uh, theoretical physics, cosmology, astronomy, uh, Mm -hmm. like uh, uh, writers like Mishukaku, and, nope. uh, and Carl Sagan and um, Stephen Hawking, you know, those kind of writers. Have, yeah. have you read any Mishukaku? Uh, I have read, uh, yes, I've read a little bit of him. I've read Carl Sagan and Hawking. Yeah. Um, I totally reject orthodox physics. Oh, yeah? So I, I reject their perspective. Oh, really? Uh, which is kind of an interesting story in itself. C- can you explain but, that? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I mean, it, it, it's part of what my next book is about. Oh, okay. I, I look, it's called, going to be called The Preferred Observer. Uh-huh. And uh, it's also science fiction, not a sequel to Wither We. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also libertarian, but this time the theme is more about why people believe what they believe and how uh, seeing is not believing so much as believing is seeing. Hmm. Uh, we, we tend to see what we already believe. Because I, I look around and I see things that are just very popular uh, accepted <clears throat> without question, and yet, in my opinion, disconfirming proof is easily accessible if you're interested in it. And it's mm-hmm. it's a topic that kind of fascinated me. And mm-hmm. I started writing this novel that was going to kind of explore those themes a little bit in a sort of suspense sci-fi thriller. Mm-hmm. And I had... And, of course, I was going to blame everything bad on the government because I'm a good libertarian. (laughs) And uh, I I, I don't know if you've heard of The Electric Universe. No. Is that a book? No. It is a new paradigm in science. Very, Mm -hmm. very uh, heterodox, Mm -hmm. uh, fringe. uh, It would be called pseudoscience by orthodox people, although they're wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I had heard of The Electric Universe, kind of looked into it a little bit, Mm -hmm. read what I thought was a very devastating critique and just kind of dismissed it. Mm-hmm. And so I was going to use the electric universe as a paradigm which had taken hold of science. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was going to have been done through, you know, government bureaucracy, imposing standards and that kind of stuff. And I was going to explain how this obviously wrong viewpoint came to dominate. Mm-hmm. And I remember I got to chapter 19 and then I finally said, okay, I, I need to research this a little deeper because I at least want to be fair to it. Mm-hmm. So I need to research this a little deeper so I at least know what I'm talking about. So I started researching it, and it won me over <laughs> when I went deeper into it. I am now an, an advocate of the electric universe. Hmm. Uh, 
for a hundred million different reasons. I could talk about that for 12 hours. But uh, so anyway, I had to go back and change my book. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't you, don't you hate, you, the electric you, universe was going to be the little guy being suppressed by big science. Mm. Uh, so, but yeah, so anyway, that I, I, I was already at that point pretty sure that the Big Bang was crap. Uh, I did not reject Einstein at that point. I did reject the Big Bang, mm-hmm. uh, but now I'm I, I, I finding the electric universe was a very similar experience to finding libertarianism, a sudden and Austrian economics. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, I could see things with clarity that I didn't see before. Can you can you explain a little bit the electric universe? Yeah, more than happy to. <clears throat> the basic <clears throat> view of orthodox science to be as fair to it as I can be, is a view of neutral bodies in space that are disconnected and interact gravitationally. Would you say that's a fair appraisal of the orthodox view of physics and cosmology? Sounds about right. (laughs) Okay. The electric universe views these as charged bodies connected through the plasma that we now know runs throughout the universe, Uh, And they interact more, not that gravity doesn't exist, but they interact more electrically than they do gravitationally. Mm -hmm. Uh, So basic, I mean, to to make a pitch for it in in 15 seconds, (laughs) everything you see in the sky, and I mean everything you see up in the sky, can be reproduced in a plasma physics lab down here on Earth in miniature. Mm Mm-hmm. From the sunspots, Saturn's rings, even the shape and r- flat rotational curves of uh, galaxies can be reproduced in a plasma physics lab. So 99.999% of the universe is plasma, and a very tiny bit is solids, liquids, and gases. The rest of it's plasma everywhere. Mm-hmm. So when you see plasma-looking effects in the presence of plasma, I mean, I know what William of Ockham would say. It, I, I think the mystery solved. There's no need to invoke dark matter, mm-hmm. no need for dark energy, gravity waves, mm-hmm. alternate universes, extra dimensions. None of this stuff is necessary. Everything we see happening up there is easily reproducible in a plasma physics lab. Hmm. Uh, and I, I think our modern cosmology comes from a time really before... W- we knew what electricity was uh, and the there were some people like uh, Christian Birkeland and some other 19th century scientists who were kind of starting to say, you know, comets are behaving in an electric fashion. I can reproduce this in my lab. And you did have some lines of argument going that way, but it, it got stomped on by the orthodox viewpoint in big science, which later really turned towards mathematics and away from uh, away from what I think a physical science should be. It's mm-hmm. too mathematical, not enough experimentation, and no one accepts a, a falsifying observation anymore. Uh, but it, it, it does, it, it, so I, I think our days of cosmology are, as Wall Thornhill says, in the gaslight stage mm-hmm. of science or, you know, evolving out of that, and no one ever really considered the role of electricity in space. Uh, in fact, uh, modern astronomers and cosmologists aren't even educated on plasma. There's no mention of it in astronomy textbooks. Hmm. Uh, it's often referred to as a hot wind which, or a hot gas, which is not the case any more than a gas is a hot liquid. It's its own state of matter and it behaves differently. And it behaves in such a way that you can explain everything you see up in the sky. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the, the recent uh, close encounter with the Rosetta Comet, it, 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 for, for someone who advocates for the electric universe, I've, as you can see, I've torn my hair out uh, <laughs> thinking about it is because they're, they're staring at the answer right in the face. All these things that were surprised by this, oh my goodness, we didn't expect this, and blah, 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 all predicted by the electric universe. Hmm. Uh, and... But they're so ingrained in in their paradigm uh, that believing is seeing. They believe it's uh, 
well, they used to call it dirty snowballs. Now they call them snowy dirt balls or whatever. They believe in them so strongly they can't see anything else. But, I mean, it's so, so clear uh, that electricity is, is what's involved here if you really take a look at it. But they don't study plasma or electricity. Mm-hmm. So 99.999% of the universe is plasma, and they know next to nothing about plasma. So, of course, they're coming up with things like dark matter because they, they don't understand what they're looking at. But a plasma physicist can tell you what's going on, in broad terms at least. There's a lot of work to be done on the details. Wow, very nice. I, I've never heard that <laughs> that, that uh, theory. So I said 15 seconds. That went on a little bit longer. Awesome. No, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, it's uh, fascinating. I never heard that. Um, yeah. can, you, can you also, before we, uh, before we end, can you go into, you said you reject um, the Big Bang yeah. Can, can you go into why and, and uh, you know, what you see? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I rejected the Big Bang even before I rejected Einstein, uh, just because it was never a theory that made any good predictions. They just kept updating the details of the theory when information would come in that they didn't expect. So you, you've got something that's supposed to be an explosion of space-time outward. Mm. So how do you get the clumping of galaxies that you see. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, 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 it couldn't happen that way. Now, they've calculated that if at the moment of the Big Bang, all this matter started moving towards each other, there would be just enough time for it to form the superclusters that we see today. But, of course, it wouldn't be moving. It would be, they'd be moving away from each other. There's a, a, an explosion is going to scatter things. So that's that's one reason why it's a problem. Another reason why it's a problem is it's uh, you you don't have uh, the uniformity in all directions that you should see from a Big Bang. There's too many. Uh, you, you don't have the isotropy hmm. is, is what they refer to it as. Uh, I mean, there, there's a one point in time where I had a whole list of things I could go through. But, I mean, the Big Bang... I came to see very quick. Also, uh, the predictions of the temperature of uh, the interstellar medium were wrong. The people who predicted the temperature pretty closely were the ones who believed in a steady state universe. Hmm. The Big Bang people were off uh, sometimes by orders of magnitude and how cool they thought the interstellar medium should be. When they finally found out the temperature, the Big Bang advocates have done what did what they have always done is they changed their retrodictions to match the data but mm-hmm. they did predict it beforehand mm-hmm. I mean, there, there were tons of problems that went into uh that it is just a bad theory and i think it's very emblematic of modern science there's no such thing as a falsifying prediction anymore mm-hmm. uh you, there, there was a comet, I forget, it might have been linear, I forget which comet it was, but there was a comet that broke apart, exploded, essentially. Mm-hmm. And they were surprised uh, when it exploded when it did, but they took spectrographic analyses of the comet, which had exploded, so presumably we're looking at its innards, and they found no water. Hmm. It was as dry as a bone. Okay, the theory's done, guys. Comets are not dirty snowballs. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe the electric universe is right, maybe it's wrong, but it's certainly not a dirty snowball. You just saw a comet break up. You took a spectrographic analysis. There's no water. Mm-hmm. The theory's done. <laughs> there have been comets that have passed through the sun and come out intact on the other side. Really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a dirty snowball. Wow. And we just landed on Rosetta, and there's nothing there but rock. Mm-hmm. And, and it's funny listening to these guys talk about it because they, they can't confront the truth. They, mm-hmm. they, well, it's a rock-like substance. It's really, it was harder than we thought it would be. Mm-hmm. The, the, the lander rebounded off the comet uh, a lot stronger than we thought it would uh, because of this, it's this rocky-like substance. No, it's not rocky-like. It's rock. Mm-hmm. It's a rock. It's it's not made of snow or ice. It's supposed to be this, you know, loosely packed bunch of debris, and it, it's obviously a big chunk of rock. Hmm. It's not a primordial snowball. I mean, we we've seen it. the The Shoemaker Levy comet that uh, crashed into Jupiter uh, some years back. 
it, it, it broke apart into a bunch of pieces. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, they tried to explain it through tidal kneading. Uh, I think there's a better electrical explanation, but they're not. And then you know, the the water they do find is a pittance, and they find the the details of the way they find it suggest that it's not coming from the comet itself. It's probably being electrically chemically created, hmm. uh, which is a process that can be reproduced in a lab here, but. Hmm. And then a lot of what they call water is not H2O, it's just OH. And they say, well, it's OH, you know, photo dissociation got rid of one of the hydrogen molecules, but we're going to call it water. But <laughs> most it's not water, it's OH. Hmm. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's just they, they don't accept falsifying observations. Hmm. When the comet breaks apart and you analyze it and there's no water there, that theory has been falsified. I mean, if that doesn't falsify the theory, I don't know what would. Hmm. Wow! So, cool, fascinating. Um, yeah. So, so, uh, so, real quick, which, which, um, I, I, so I assume Mishukaku, Stephen Hawking, and Carl Sagan, you would consider them orthodox? Uh, yes. Right. Completely. Although I have a lot of respect for Carl Sagan, but yeah, he's an orthodox. He's definitely in the Einsteinian orthodox tradition. Yeah. So, can you name some some unorthodox uh, scientists or physicists or? Well, I'll say Christian Berkland, simply even though the orthodoxy claims him now, he for a long time, he was ridiculed. He was the one who said, I think uh, Earth's aurora are due to ions coming from the sun. Mm-hmm. And he was ridiculed right up to the point where they sent a satellite up there and said, oh, he was right. So now he's embraced in the mainstream, but he's he was originally one of those. Um, there's a man by the name of Bruce was his last name. I think Charles Bruce. He was an astronomer who also had studied as an electrical engineer. Hmm. And he had that electrical engineering background. So when he looked in the sky, he started seeing things that reminded him of electrical effects in plasma. Mm -hmm. So he's another one. Ralph Juergens was one. He was the one who, I think he was the first one to come up with an electric uh, model of the sun that does not rely on nuclear fusion. Another theory which has been falsified dozens of times over. Hmm. Uh, it was a guess at the beginning. Okay, not a bad guess. At the time, fusion was becoming, you know, nuclear physics was becoming a thing. Fusion, okay, fine, it's internally driven by fusion. But I would, I would say it's been falsified in a number of different ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ralph Juergens developed a model where the sun is an anode, which is a positive and in a uh, system. And then the heliopause is the cathode. Uh, Wall Thornhill is the probably, and Don Scott are the two big scientists currently alive uh, who are looking, uh, studying into it. In fact, they're just finishing up an experiment called the Sapphire Experiment. And I want to get more details of this, but they actually were able to reproduce the sun in miniature in a lab. Hmm. Using the sun as an as an anode hmm. and running an electric current through it, hmm. I mean they they reproduced the reverse temperature gradient. They had coronal mass ejections. Hmm. They had sunspots. <clears throat> they had the granulation that you see, hmm. and they even had some indications that some fusion was going on on the surface because we know there's fusion going on in the sun because there are neutrinos coming up, mm-hmm. but. Uh, uh, according to kind of a preview report I heard, uh, they said they were able to match the data they got from their experiment and match it perfectly to the data being gathered from the sun. Mm-hmm. So that that's extremely exciting. And I, I, I mean, I, I at this point am pretty much convinced we live in an electric universe. Uh, I find it extremely exciting. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> That's the first time I hear all this, but wow, fascinating stuff. Uh, Check it out at thunderbolts.info if you want to look more into it. There's uh, uh, thunderbolts.info, also holoscience.com, H-O-L-O science.com. Uh, also, have one quick question. Before I uh, I stopped reading about all this stuff, you know, uh, phys- theoretical physics and cosmology, I was I read a little bit about the M-theory. Um, yeah. Is that is that Would that also be considered orthodoxy? Yeah, well, or super string, super string theory. Yes, yeah, so the string theory, string theory has a number of detractors. Okay. Uh, I, I, I mean, yeah, it, it's within the orthodox tradition, but 
at this point, I would say that it's not dogmatic. Like, I think Einstein, the nuclear fusion model of the sun, the impact theory of craters, things like that are pretty dogmatic. Mm -hmm. String theory's got a lot of orthodox physicists and astrophysicists and such who who really criticize it. Now, Mm -hmm. some have gone so far as to say it's not even a theory. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a... There's a book by a mathematician named uh, Peter something or other. I can't think of his name. It starts with a W. Um, he had a book called Not Even Wrong, <laughs> which uh, um, Wolfgang Pauli was famously said about some theory. He said, it's so bad, it's not even wrong. <laughs> uh, and <clears throat> he criticized his string theory. Uh, Lee Smolin has his thing, The Trouble with Physics, Mm-hmm. Uh, and he he criticizes it as well. So it's, I mean, I get it. It's an idea that's getting kicked around in the orthodoxy, but it hasn't been raised to the level of dogma. <laughs> uh, in, in my opinion, I I believe in a certain a priori of physics. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that you can do physics from your armchair, but that any physical theory has to pass a certain test before you can even bother considering it. And that is, is it? conceivable mm-hmm. anything that tries to add extra dimensions is not a physical theory of this universe you can represent it mathematically mm-hmm. but it's not you're not talking about this universe mm-hmm. and relativity is lauded for its predictions which by the way is way overstated mm-hmm. but to the extent that it agrees with observed reality which it occasionally does Okay, fine, you're mathematically describing it, but you haven't created a theory that actually describes reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, you might get the right mathematical results, but there is time is not a dimension. Uh, Dimensions are a physical thing Mm -hmm. up, down, right, left, forward, back. When you can point in the direction of time, I'll, I'll consider relativity until someone can point in the direction of time. Mm-hmm. It's not. And then people say, well, he doesn't mean dimension in the same way there. But then how can he combine space time into one physical thing? I mean, it, 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 it's not something that makes any sense. Hmm. And, and it's also just kind of weird from the outset to subordinate uh, distance and uh, time to velocity. I mean, velocity is dependent on them, but here velocity is the king, and distance and time will change to accommodate the speed of the speed limit of the universe, supposedly the speed of light. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I mean, that that's a weird thing to do from the outset. I wouldn't say that falsifies it by itself, but it's awfully weird. It, it's a strange thing. Uh, so, but yeah, so any you know M theory, which is a further development of of string theory. I mean, well, I mean, there's no one string theory. There's one estimate was there are more possible string theories than there are atoms in the universe. <laughs> uh, I mean, that should be a clue you're on the wrong track. It, Science <laughs> simplifies things, which right. the electric universe does. It simplifies things. Uh, even gravity in the conception of the electric universe is kind of like a secondary effect of electricity at a subatomic level. Mm-hmm. Uh, although I consider that more speculative, but in terms of what powers the sun and what runs the galaxies, I I am quite confident it's electricity. And if if you spend some time reading it, you'll run into so many different reasons why. I mean, I, I couldn't even re- list them all for you. I could probably list you fifty reasons off the top of my head, and that's only the tip of the iceberg. Seems like every time a new press release comes out, there's another. <laughs> Another point for the electric universe, it seems like. Yeah, I I, uh, I don't mean to keep you too long, but I have too many no, questions it, for you. <laughs> dude, I can. I'll talk to midnight about this. Go ahead. <laughs> so, what is, what do you think about the uh, the flat Earth theory? Have, have you heard about that one? <laughs> <laughs> the flat Earth. Yeah. I have heard about that. <laughs> what, do you th- what, do you, what is your opinion on that one? I have to, I have to, uh, I have to hear it. <laughs> centuries ago, millennia ago, they saw the shadow of the Earth on the Moon. Right. That that cleared it up right then and there. I would say about the flat Earth. <laughs> okay, so you're not a so you think it's complete. No, I'm not a flat Earth. <laughs> okay, okay, just, cu- just curious because I first heard that from uh, you know um, Jeff Berwick's Anarchist. I don't know if you watch uh, his show. Uh, Jeff Berwick, he, writer of the Dollar Vigilante, um, and he he interviewed this guy Eric Dubay, 
who has his own he's anarchist has his own youtube channel and completely all about flat earth stuff and you know you know we never went to the moon and and you know that kind of stuff we never even broke the horizon you know the, the past our atmosphere that's, that that's really out there yeah. i mean i i guess in a movement like libertarianism you're going to attract people who are willing to throw away orthodox beliefs right 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 which i am too but yeah. i mean i'm not going to throw out everything <laughs> <laughs> i we, I, I'm I'm convinced that we have orbited the Earth, taking pictures, and it looks right. somewhat spherical. Uh, as far as the landing on the moon debate, we have telescopes that can see the stuff we left there now. Oh, so, yeah? okay, okay. I mean that they, there was never a really strong argument. I, I, I did look into it at one point because I was interested, mm -hmm. and I read the the moon hoax side, and mm -hmm. they raised some questions. I thought oh, that's kind of interesting, and then when I read the rebuttal. I just saw that. I mean, that just tears it apart. There's a really good video on YouTube. Uh, if you, it was done by a guy with a number of years of TV directing experience, mm -hmm. and all he does is examine the arguments about how uh, the footage was faked, mm -hmm. and he demonstrates beyond any reasonable doubt whatsoever that there was no way they could have faked that footage back then. Mm -hmm. So the argument that we didn't have the technology to go to the moon, but we had the technology to fake it, mm -hmm. is exactly wrong. Mm -hmm. We had the technology to go to the moon. We had rockets and yeah. go into space. We had the technology to go to the moon. We did not have the technology to fake mm -hmm. footage back then. And it, it's an excellent, it's about a 10-minute long video. Uh, all right, well, we, we can uh, definitely include all these... Look at that. Yeah, we'll include all the stuff in the description, so uh, you know all the stuff yeah. we talk about. So, wow, fascinating! <laughs> I didn't, uh, I didn't know you were so interested in that, but that's cool. It's uh, yeah, that's, it. that's awesome. I guess I, I left off thinking that my, you know what, I kn physics, it's done. Now I'm onto volunteers. <laughs> I guess there's much more down the rabbit hole you can go with that one too, right? <laughs> well, check out, uh, check out the electric universe. It's it's fascinating stuff. You know the. How much time do we have? Do no, have yeah, yeah, go ahead. What, what, okay. <laughs> the, part of the most interesting part of the electric universe, in my opinion, which the part that I at first scoffed at mm -hmm. when I was first introduced to it, but now I find it fascinating, is the human element. Mm -hmm. Because there seems to have been some type of electrical disequilibrium, disequilibrium in, uh, in the solar system within human memory that humans witnessed. And the reason we believe that is because you get some stories from all over the globe that have points of agreement that you just would not expect unless they were all seeing the same thing. Mm -hmm. For instance, there's uh, something called the squatting man. Mm -hmm. And it's a stick figure who seems to be standing in, in kind of a pose similar to what refs will do when someone scored a touchdown with his legs kind of mirroring the arms going right, you know, right. up like yeah. that. Right, right, right. But there are two dots floating out in space by the hips. And it, it's just, you know, it's an interesting little figure. But what's really fascinating about it is it's about anywhere from five to 10,000 years old, I think. They're not sure exactly how old they are, but somewhere around 10,000 years old. Hmm. But you find this figure in Spain in Armenia, in Egypt, in United Arab Emirates, in China, in Australia, <laughs> in South America, in Arizona and New Mexico, 10,000 years ago, hmm. wow. people all over the world were painting the same figure. Hmm. Now, that need, now, regardless of where you're coming from, that needs an explanation. Mm -hmm. Because that's not, I mean, if it were just circles, it'd be one thing. But this is a very specific figure with two dots yeah. outside its hips. Well, the, it turns out that that is one of the shapes that plasma instabilities will make. Hmm. And it, it, it has, uh, you know, it has this uh, kind of tube-like shape for the body. And then these other tubes at 90 degrees angle will kind of curve upwards and start to look like those arms and legs. And there's also a ring, a torus of charged particles that goes around the middle section. And if you're looking through it, 
the thickest parts you look through are through the edges, and those are the parts that are going to show up in a translucent figure. And that explains the two dots at the hips. Hmm. So, which I, you know, everyone around the world is painting this shape. It's, it's got to be something they saw in the sky. I mean, 10,000 years ago, these people were not trading from Chile all the way to China. <laughs> right. And, and, it's, and everyone is writing. And another thing about them is I think all the figures are on south facing walls. <clears throat> Excuse me, with one exception. Mm-hmm. And of course, these, these plasma instabilities will form over the poles of a spinning object. Hmm. And uh, it, so now Wall Thornhill has an explanation for. Uh, exactly what this this cosmic traffic accident was or whatever that happened in the solar system, which I find fascinating. I've read other people look at the same evidence and come up with a different story. I'm not ready to go one way or the other about who's right and who's wrong, but clearly there was some type of electrical upset in the solar system within human memory that we saw. There's a reason why cultures all over the world used to call Saturn the sun. Hmm. There's a reason why cultures all over the world refer to Venus as a comet. Hmm. Uh, I mean, the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, all these people, their old word for the sun was Saturn or Hmm. whatever their word was. Uh, There's these points of agreement between the different cultures. Uh, In the Bible, they talk about... uh, you know, the Battle of Jericho, I think it was, when the the sun stopped moving across the sky for however many days. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a tradition on the other side of the world in South America where the sun disappeared for several days and didn't come back. <laughs> so there, there's things like this. You, you've, you've obviously you got to be careful with this kind of stuff. But when you start to see the same things repeated in cultures all over the planet and you start seeing the same symbol like the sun with tire spokes – uh, or bull horns with a with with like a moon or some body in the middle of these boon horn bull horns that looks like a crescent moon on its side. Or so you see these symbols all over the planet. You you got to think it's something they were all seeing. Hmm. And uh, the electric universe explanation is they were looking at a sky that was just very different from the one we have now. Why did so many people? refer to Mars as some sort of scarred figure. Like I think the Iroquois said he was scarred in his thigh. Uh, other people said he called him Scarface, things like that. Hmm. And, of course, there's that great Valus Marineris on Mars that looks like a scar and was very clearly not created by water. Hmm. Uh, I mean, from afar, it looks like Maybe it was, but when you get up close, you start seeing, no, that, I mean, there's no tributaries, no way for water to escape. Mm-hmm. And you can reproduce that scar on Mars with electricity, of course, in a plasma physics lab. <laughs> uh, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's really fascinating. I've, I haven't even gotten the tip of the iceberg out here. There's so much to it, but it's, it, it's one of the most exciting things. It makes science so much fun, I think. Cool. And all this, this, this look for a unifying theory, which, you know, you got about a hundred years and you can't get a unifying theory. That's a, that's a sign that you're on the wrong track. Hmm. But if you can reduce things to electricity to explain it, it's simpler. And I think William of Ockham would approve. All right. I mean, <laughs> isn't that what Albert Einstein was after though, the grand unified theory? And simple- well, he yeah. wasn't after grand unified theory. He, he came up with a theory of gravity. Oh, okay. And then, of course, there's uh, quantum mechanics, which was <clears throat> about everything else, and the two just won't fit with each other. Mm, okay. <clears throat> In simple terms, that's it. The, there's the my, famous Michelson-Morley experiment, which attempted to find the ether and was reported as a null result, like there is no ether, although that is actually incorrect. They didn't get a null result. They just got a much smaller effect than they thought they would. Mm-hmm. And then Dayton Miller spent his whole career reproducing the Michelson-Morley experiment and finding an ether. But mm-hmm. uh, there was an attempt by a couple guys like Lorenz and Fitzgerald to explain how he got this null result and there could still be an ether. And one of the things they hit upon was length contraction. 
So that was an idea Einstein picked up on and incorporated in his theory, although what he did was just get rid of the ether. But of course, the uh, uh, what was the, not Faraday, um, starts with an M. The 19th century scientist worked with electricity. I can't think of his name. I'm so bad with names. Uh, but anyway, his, his equations didn't work without an ether. But uh, Einstein just blithely, blithely got rid of it. Uh, although later on in life, he, he said it was a mistake, and he got roundly criticized for trying to bring the ether back. But uh, wow. so, that, so Einstein was – now, he said at the time he was not aware of the Michelson-Morley experiment. Mm-hmm. He was just working on some other ideas that had happened. Uh, you know, people credit him with length contraction and E equals MC squared. Mm-hmm. Most of the stuff in his special and general relativity theories, as, as in all things, was borrowing on work other people were doing. So he was just kind of going in that tradition. Mm-hmm. It's like people say that Tesla invented the radio. What Tesla actually did was put the finishing touches on a long line of work from other individuals who each contributed something. And so Einstein was doing the same thing. He contributed a little bit to a line of thought that was going on, although one that I think is very wrong. Hmm. Wow, cool. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, I, I imagine you could go on for hours <laughs> talking about yeah. this. I believe you now. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we'll have to uh, cut it off. Maybe we'll, we'll maybe we'll uh, have you back on and talk more about this. this I would love to. Seems like, it seems well, like you have a lot to say on these topics <laughs> also as well. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, before we go, just, um, just uh, plug your books and your websites again just uh, to remind yeah. the listeners. There's a website, witherwe.com, W-I-T-H-U-R-W-E.com. You can get a free download of the book. It's also available on Amazon. Uh, MatthewBruceAlexander.com is going to be my blog site. As soon as I someone kicks me in the butt and gets me actually writing on that, I've got only a few articles right now. And then the Preferred Observer is being edited right now. I hope to publish that. I will publish that before the year is over. The Preferred Observer that will be coming out and will also be available for free. I don't believe in intellectual property, so awesome. it was available for free. And you're free to write fan fiction if you want. I can say some authors try to stomp down on that. I do not understand them. I encourage it. If you want to write fan fiction for what, anything I've done, what, I'm, what, 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 do you, what do you mean fan fiction? Can you explain that? Oh, so, yeah. Sometimes people take characters from a. Uh, a series they like and write their own stories with those characters. Oh, I usually see. involving I sexually explicit material. But <laughs> really, <laughs> well, a lot of people do. That's funny. <laughs> um, but I mean, some authors get upset when people write fan fiction. And I just think you're you're an idiot. You're an idiot. <laughs> These are your fans, and they're publicizing. They're giving you free publicity. Right. Exactly. Sure. Right. So I, I encourage it. You can take my stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm all about Creative Commons attribution. Sure. And that's all. Sure, definitely. Just, so that's how you get your 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 name out there, and your you know, absolutely what, you, what you're trying to you know the message. It's like David Friedman out. said: when you're young, you're afraid people will will steal your ideas. When you're old, you're afraid that they won't. Right. So, <laughs> so. I guess by that measure, I'm an old old man right now. <laughs> awesome. Or we're just ahead of the curve, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Or that's it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome very good cool conversation uh glad we did this uh, so if anyone wants to donate to me uh you can do so through paypal um or bitcoin and uh you can also check out the patreon link i have in the description you know we all uh we all uh do this out of the passion of our hearts but uh in the end time is money <laughs> or in this yeah. case time is family <laughs> so, <laughs> you know? who, so who uh, too? <laughs> yeah yeah so any uh any donation, any help, you know, help out uh, Matthew here, help me out. You know, it, it's uh, it's only going to um, I- increase the likelihood people will see, you know, uh, the ideas of liberty, of Austrian economics, of anarcho-capitalism. So it can only be for good, right? So awesome. uh, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for coming on. I really enjoyed it. Oh, I appreciate you having me. I had a great time. Yeah, definitely do it again. Uh, so this is um, Peace for Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.